With that, I'll introduce Myla Kelly, who's the Peaks and Prairie Center Coordinator here at Montana State University, and she will be presenting today. Thanks, Tori. Well, welcome. Good afternoon again. Um, I'd just like to thank you guys for joining in and taking the time to learn about this E3 in Montana Agricultural Initiative, which um, I really have found in the past um, year or so that we've started with this um, particular program that I really think it has the potential to bring some of the best programs of our federal agency partners together. To the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> Dory, did it just start? Okay, well I'll just go ahead and um, and get started again. I'm not sure if, it, if we just started or if we actually started when Tori did her introduction. But um, I'd like to welcome you and good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining in and taking the time to learn about this initiative, E3 in Montana Agriculture, that I believe really has the potential to bring out some of the best programs of our federal agency partners together and to identify and encourage energy efficiency practices in agricultural production, um, both in Montana and, and beyond Montana as well. I think this is a good model that could um, perhaps be replicated in other states. Um, but before we talk about this particular um, project, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. I'm not sure who I know who's on the phone, but um, again, my name is Myla Kelly. I'm the coordinator of EPA's Region 8 Pollution Prevention Information Center, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically um, I'm a Montana State University employee, but we're funded um, by EPA through a funding mechanism called the Federal Pollution Prevention Act, which was created in 1990. And we're funded to really sort of disseminate information to um, within EPA's Region 8, which we um, which includes North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, and Montana, of course. <laughs> and um, and our our um, our task is to provide pollution prevention outreach, um, and, and this could covers often a, a, a wide variety of topics, but to encourage the adoption of practices that reduce pollution at the source rather than at the end of the pipe. So after you know, it's being um, any type of pollutants are released into the environment. Um, so we serve um, we serve EPA to that end. In addition to serving as a pollution prevention center, we also coordinate the National Tribal Pollution Prevention Work Group, which is comprised of 80 tribes around the country, and that's um, uh, sort of collaborating with tribal environmental professionals um, that work for their different tribal communities. Um, and regionally, we also manage the Gre Regional Greening Local Government Initiative. We are located at Montana State University in Bozeman, and we're part of um, the Housing and Environmental Health Department of Extension. I've managed our P2 Center, which Mike Vogel is the director, for a little over four years now. And um, what I really love most about it is that I um, have the opportunity to convene professionals in whatever the different topic is that we're dealing with, um, you know, convene these professionals that have a vested interest in a particular issue, um, convene them together, and, and that learning process sort of just happens organically from there. Um, so I want to first introduce what E3 is. So this is an E3A <laughs> um, series, and E3 is um, uh, a bit of an unfortunate, or fortunate, I guess it depends on how you look at it, acronym. Um, E3 is a nationwide multi-federal partner initiative. Um, it is taking place nationwide for the purpose of working with communities to connect small and medium-sized manufacturers with experts from federal agencies, states, regions. Um, and the purpose of this is to take the technical expertise, the grants, the funding opportunities that all of these different federal agency partners, local partners have, and to customize um, technical assessments on manufacturing, um, to customize assessments in order to identify pollution prevention opportunities, energy efficiency opportunities, so that um, whether we're working with manufacturers or some of, in some cases, this E3 initiative has taken off across um, the state of, say, North, North Carolina has really embraced this as a statewide basis, or Alabama has embraced this on a community-wide basis um, to minimize their carbon footprint while in increasing productivity. So the partners that are involved in E3, and you can, they have a great website, um, e3.gov, uh, the partners that are involved are the Department of Commerce, you can see across the bottom, the Department of Energy, EPA, Department of Labor, USDA, and the Small Business Administration. So that's what E3A is, uh, or sorry, E3 is. Um, 
this is a map of where E3 um, initiatives or technical assessments are taking place. And you can see that some of the heavy hitters include um, Alabama and Texas, um, but here we are in Montana. We've got a few assessments, and these are, this is what I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, but you can see it's really a sort of um, a collaborative effort, not to create new initiatives, but to sort of pull them together. Um, let's see. Where's my little? There we are. Okay. So E3 in Montana agriculture. So USDA, um, you know, when I went across that list of agency partners on the bottom, um, USDA was one of the re most recent federal partners that were added to this framework. And they're a bit unsure as to what their role could be in this E3 framework. Meanwhile, I've been present for years of discussions as this E3 framework was being rolled out. And I was wondering how best E3 could fit in our state or region and what our role could potentially be. Um, as you probably know better than I, Ag is a huge economic driver in our region, um, EPA's Region 8, and over where over half of the land in Region 8 is devoted to agriculture. And when we talk more specifically about Montana, we have closer to two-thirds of our land acres devoted to agriculture. Um, we have 30,000 farms in Montana, averaging a couple of thousand acres each. Now, for each ag operation, energy costs are a significant portion of their operating costs. So ag is important, lowering, ag co uh, sorry, lower, lowering energy costs is important, and our environment is certainly important. And that was the backdrop to, backdrop to developing this um, project in Montana. Our initial discussions began in spring of 2012. In 2012, we were awarded um, a source reduction grant from US EPA for $110,000. And the objective of that grant was to conduct hands-on E3 assessments or audits, whatever word you prefer. We sort of use them interchangeably, but audit always makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but you know, we use them. We do use them interchangeably. Um, we work with our ag. The purpose was to work with our agricultural community to reduce energy consumption, increase productivity, minimize carbon emissions, prevent pollution, and drive innovation. So the basic tenets of the E3 framework, but just putting them into place in an agricultural context. Um, in the fall of 2012, we sort of built this team of partners um, and began this, this pilot process, which I'll talk about. In the fall of 2013, we were awarded an additional grant of 90000 to expand this pilot to statewide implementation, and that's what we're in the, um, in the midst of right now. So. Um, Throughout our project development and meetings, particularly with USDA, our USDA partners, we came up with this overarching goal, and that was to ensure that by participating in E3, we've put our agricultural producers in the best position possible to maximize available financial opportunities in order to implement E3 recommendations. So what this basically means is that we want to ensure that any ag producer that goes through the trouble and the process of participating in these E3 assessments will actually be in a decent position to, if they so choose, apply for funding opportunities through um, USDA or any some of those other federal partners. But we want to make sure that they qualify after they go through this process for those um, grant cost share, loan, whatever they are, funding opportunities. So the goal is really simple, but it was important because it was very critical in designing how we were going to do our assessments and really in designing the rest of our project. Because we needed to ensure that our E3 Ag assessments were meeting the highest bar possible for funding opportunities. So determining what that highest bar was was a process in and of itself, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, um, but not into too much detail. Um, so how do we make that happen? We, there's three, you know, three pretty critical components. Um, first, we need farmers and landscapes to work with. We need access to farmers' land and their operations. And there can be a trust issue here. You know, when I list out our federal E3 partners, that doesn't necessarily elicit a sigh of relief <laughs> from lots of folks. You know, it's, it's almost daunting. Um, our Montana farmers are dealing with old regulations, new regulations, changing regulations, disappearing farm bills, reappearing versions of farm bills. Um, and while I'm not certainly advocating one way or another on those regulations, we needed to recognize that there can be an understandable trust hurdle to um, to overcome, to even have access to, or even to find willing producers. Um, once we've identified folks to work with, um, the second step is to really get a bunch of boots on the ground. So assessments, audits, these are all kind of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, step 
um, production facility by production facility. And so they take time. Um, the write-ups take time. The interviewing takes time. Um, you know, gathering all the data, it's, it, it's, um, it's an investment. And so um, we need folks other than myself or, you know, other than a couple people, we need people to do this work. Um, and third, audits need to be beneficial to those willing to participate. Um, one of those benefits is being able to secure opportunities to cost share or otherwise assist in the investment of implementing ener energy efficiency audit recommendations. So sure, you know, we can do an assessment, we can do an audit um, and identify energy efficiency opportunities, but um, you know, many of those opportunities may be expensive. Um, producers might be interested in getting some cost share or some, um, some grants or loans to do that. And, um, and it is only through the implementation of those recommendations that we're seeing any benefit to the farmer, the producer, or where we're seeing any environmental benefit as well. So um, that was really an important step in, in making this, um, this process a success or of any benefit at all. So we identified that this is what we needed to do. And now we look at all of these partners that, that are involved in the E-Tree process. And we try and figure out, you know, how do we solve the challenge of gaining trust, getting these boots on the ground, and getting farmers secured for implementation dollars and getting um, our producers bought in when we're looking at this landscape of different logos and um, potential partners. And what we decided was, um, and this is where I believe that this E3 and Ag model that we've developed and that we're utilizing, um, and that is utilizing the existing talents, training, and working with our land-grant university extension agents and professionals, where we believe that that model that we'll, I'll talk about much more um, can be widely and successfully used and replicated. Um, and really, it's just that building and capital capitalizing on what is now a century worth of extension work um, in bringing science, ag, engineering research to the people in our state. Um, it is really only through this extension partnership um, that I think that this E3 and Ag concept will succeed. Um, our extension agents have an established trust relationship with producers, and in this project, um, they are critical in, number one, finding producers willing to participate in an E3 assessment, uh, two, communicating the benefit of this E3 assessment and subsequent implementation of recommendations, so communicating that to the producer and also to the community in general, um, and three, communicating successful outcomes to other producers in the state. We do have some other very important partners in this process, um, and um, specifically, um, they are, or, or most importantly, um, they are some of the three divisions of uh, three divisions of USDA, including the Natural Resource Conservation Service, Rural Development, and the Farm Service Agency. And I'm going to talk about what each of those brings to the table in this process. Um, NRCS is um, is very uh, has what they can bring as far as the tools and expertise that they've developed is, um, you know, I can't emphasize enough. Um, NRCS has developed numerous technical tools such as the Cropland Energy Estimator, um, some irrigation data sheets that I'll show you in a minute that are really critical and important in calculating many of the um, E3 metrics. Um, NRCS also, in addition to some of their technical expertise, um, which is vast, they also have um, funding sources, cost share programs such as the Environmental Quality Incentives Program that can provide um, cost sharing um, at a very sort of um, regulated, you know, it's all, um, uh, they've identified exactly how much of a cost share they can provide to all numerous different practices, um, conservation practices. And, um, and this funding source we identified as our highest bar. If you remember earlier I was saying, well, you know, what is that highest bar that our assessments or audits needed to meet? And um, through our working with our partnerships, we determined that this was, in fact, our highest bar. And we needed to make sure that our assessments were compliant with EQIP requirements. Um, our other um, other key um, um, opportunities or relationships from USA is from the Rural Development Program. Their grant and loan opportunities um, that they have available include the Renewable Energy for America Program, their Value Added Producer Grants, and their Loan Guarantee Programs. Um, through the Farm Services 
agency, um, they can provide a guaranteed conservation, or they have available guaranteed conservation loans, which provide a maximum loan amount of over a million dollars to implement any conservation practice in an NRCS-approved conservation plan. So again, that's kind of getting back to um, that highest bar and making sure that we meet that so that if a producer was interested in qualifying or applying for a guaranteed conservation loan, it's not through NRCS, but it does need to qualify as an NRCS-approved plan. So very important, and very important to have done our homework in this um, before we kind of went down the road. So. We began by soliciting applications from our MSU Extension agents. Um, we'd selected six agents, um, and this was last spring. Um, these six agents were interested and willing in, number one, being trained in aspects of on-farm energy efficiency. Um, we'll talk a little bit more specifics about what those, what those components are in a second. Um, number two, they were willing and committed to finding a producer in their area who is interested and willing to have an assessment and audit completed. Number three, they agreed to conduct the assessment. Um, and number four, they agreed to work with um, a contractor that we had um, uh, an arrangement with um, that who had much expertise and in, in these certain qualifications through NRCS. Um, in energy auditing, and this, this contractor was sort of paid on a retainer so that they could work um, with our agents who, our agents conducted the assessments and, and did the initial write-up, but we wanted to make sure that they had someone to ask questions to and that at the end the contractor um, would sign off on these assessments and say, yes, you know, this is a thorough job and, um, and these meet the qualifications um, that NRCS is looking for. So the agent needed to be willing to work with that particular, um, or needed to be willing to work with a contractor to um, to get the reports and in, in the uh, assessments in the in the in the form that they needed to be. So we held our first training um, hosted by Granite County in beautiful Phillipsburg, Montana. For anyone who's been there, um, we did our classroom piece at the Broadway Inn, um, and we did our on-site work at the Skinner Ranch. So it's really a a kind of really neat opportunity, and these stars represent where our initial pilot agents were from. So we tried to get a cross section from all around the state. Um, as I mentioned before, but it's a little bit confusing, so it's worth reiter reiterating. Um, we determined that NRCS was our, our highest bar. So for our pilot, we decided to fairly strictly follow this NRCS model. And what they do um, is they divide ag production into two categories, landscape and headquarters. So simply speaking, headquarters are the buildings and the operations. Landscape is the production practices. So obviously things aren't really ever that clear cut, but it's kind of a starting point. So you know everything that you see here, the shops, the building envelopes, lighting, um, uh, you know, any kind of dairy machinery, um, that all comes under a headquarters assessment. Anything related to production practices, and I'll show you that in a little bit, that's that kind of falls under the landscape um, energy efficiency category. So we went through, we, we had our training, and our agents went forth and conducted their audits. Um, these audits took us to really all corners and borders of the states. We did, we had one that was an organic multi-cropping facility um, on the left, and these are not qualified <laughs> um, uh, agents or producer or um, assessors, but they were somewhat helpful in hauling buckets of lentils. Um, we went down to the southwest part of the state where we learned about this ingenious thing called the love machine, which is this um, unique way of, um, of automating flood a flood irrigation pasture. Um, we learned irrigation efficiency techniques, and we worked also with a bunch of, with, with some grain drying. So we really kind of covered the gamut. Um, we learned a couple of things through these audits. One of our major findings of this pilot was sort of the duh moment, that one of the primary drivers um, of energy consumption, obviously. I said this is kind of a dumb moment, but that's a critical avenue for identifying energy efficiency opportunities is diesel efficiency um, and maintenance as well. And we realized that diesel maintenance in particular um, is not 
super well captured through the NRCS models. And so when we did our pilot training that was sort of based around these NRCS models, um, we didn't do a we didn't do enough in, uh, in being able to train our agents in diesel efficiency and maintenance um, um, opportunities and recommendations that they could provide to their producers. So we recognize that through this process and we're remedying that for our next training um, with the help of one of our agents that um, is working closely with our um, MSU Northern partners to, to, to create a training and, and a way of capturing that data very consistently across farms. Um, the other thing we found was that um, the uh, the other big energy efficiency um, opportunity on farms um, for those that are irrigated outside of the building envelopes lighting um, themselves is irrigation. Um, that we knew um, would be a big um, a big one that we would find. And NRCS has some great energy efficiency models, which we did use. But we realized that in our next phase, we need to go beyond um, beyond just using those models and actually lease a flow meter so we can go from prediction to reality and look at um, at not just whether this is the right size, but um, but what flow is is actually coming out um, through this um, through whatever irrigation mechanism we're looking at. So um, so for our next round, you know, beyond the pilot and going to statewide implementation, we're going to lease an actual flow meter so that our agents can can get some actual measurements. Um, on the irrigation. So everybody's really excited about that because um, that comes up a lot. That's important to many of us. So um, I'm going to talk about, so we talked about the landscape evaluations. I'm going to quickly show you some of the data that um, uh, are, this is from um, one of our extension agents in um, in Phillipsburger, in Granite County, Dan Lucas. Um, he usually, in the past, he's done this part of the presentation. And I certainly won't do it justice um, or try to repeat what he would say. But I just want to show you some of the different worksheets and data components that go into these assessments. So again, this is a landscape assessment, or this, would go, this is what would go into a landscape energy efficiency evaluation. Um, and that's everything that doesn't relate to buildings, basically. Um, here is um, an example of some data that we pulled from this particular producer that already existed. So he previously, two years ago or something, he had already gone through a process with our local utility, with his local utility, which um, happened to be Northwest Energy. But but um, wherever you are, um, whoever your utility is, there's probably a program in place where they will, where they will come um, to your facility and do some kind of an initial assessment. And those are just, you know, great baseline, you know, points of information to begin with. So um, this had been done in the past, and um, it's great data to use and to maybe move beyond or to see where you're at now, if that had been a few years ago. Um, but this is an example of an irrigation system audit report that they had provided, and that was used um, when we took this data and used the NRCS models for that. Um, and here are some other graphs that that, um, that that report actually came up with. Um, this is the irrigation tool from the NRCS. So um, a bunch of information <laughs> goes into um, into getting these estimates or these, you know, actually filling out the boxes. Um, but the but it's not overwhelming. And if Dan was here, he would probably say that um, that he enjoyed using this. That it wasn't it was in, it was somewhat intuitive um, to be able to enter this data and to um, to get some predictions of. Of, um, of changing your irrigation practices or um, your pump sizes, what would happen if you if you did move um, to a different type of irrigation practice? What would your energy savings be? What would your water use savings be? Um, and you can see in this user input um, things like your power source, um, your irrigation system, your well lift, your pressure, um, your energy costs, all that information needs to go into this calculator in order to um, come up with an um, an energy analysis. Um, your acres irrigated and what your crop is, and that all factors in. Um, this is an example. So again, landscape isn't just the irrigation part of it. It's also um, uh, the the um, uh, your crop uh, your crop 
land practices, I guess. I'm not thinking of the right word right now. But um, they, NRCS, again, has a tool called the Cropland Energy Estimation Tool, which is quite extensive. Um, and in that tool, you um, enter in um, all the different crop names. The last year they were harvested, the biomass yield ratio, um, how they were harvested, um, the operation, the um, operation description, the number of times per year, um, and then the estimated diesel use is calculated for you. So this, as you can see, is um, quite extensive. And this is, these are all, um, this is a, a large spreadsheet, but there's many choices under each. So you don't, um, the choices are provided for you and you pick from a menu that's available. Um, and here, this is the um, greenhouse gas emission coefficients that are calculated um, based on your energy inputs. And those are some of the factors that go into um, the landscape side of this analysis. So you can see it's pretty extensive. Um, now, in the headquarters can, um, side of things, um, this is at the Skinner Ranch, um, we, um, we, we look at some other um, avenues for energy savings, and that includes lighting. Obviously, that's a big one. So we have some, um, uh, some, um, some spreadsheets that you fill out with, um, with what the particular lighting is and what particular, um, what the lamp type is, the wattage, the length, um, the days used per year, um, what, what the location is, and that can be pretty extensive. So here is a list of lamp types and wattages typically found in ag enterprises. So this list in and of itself helps a great deal in um, using the, the kind of behind the scenes calculators here to determine what your energy usage is and how that can be improved. So that's the data that went into it. We have um, into these assessments um, for each of our um, energy audits. We have the data. They've written up their reports. We haven't posted them um, yet, but that will be coming at e3.peaksterprairies.org. Um, and uh, those, all of those things sort of formed the, the pilot assessment piece of this project. Now we're in the stage of next steps. So we have these recommendations for producers to um, decrease their efficiency or decrease their energy uses, usage on the farm. So we have our assessments complete, but now what do we do? Um, for those producers wanting to pursue funding or cost sharing, you know, where do they go? How do they apply? Who can help them apply? Um, there's obvious synergies with the many USDA programs that I talked about, but what about from other E3 agency partners or um, often from your state Department of Environmental Quality or whatever that's um, called in your state? Um, or what about some private funders? Um, the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems funders often um, have funding available for energy efficiency projects. So there's a lot of options, but it's very challenging to sort through all of these options and figure out, um, you know, what fits best. And this is, um, this is the, the, a process that we're actually going through right now. Um, you know, once we have this laundry list of funding opportunities, we need to identify what's a good fit. Um, we need to sit down and communicate with the local offices, particularly the USDA offices, to get an indication of whether we're on the right track. Would this particular project fit under this particular funding mechanism? Um, for projects that don't cleanly fit, fit within a particular program, what are some other creative funding mechanisms that we can look at? Um, one way, one avenue for identifying this, you know, what's a good fit is um, this funding opportunities for energy efficiency projects in ag production. This is something that we've just completed um, in the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure if it's up on our website yet, but um, it's, it's a tool with that we developed with an ag producer, an extension agent, an educator in mind. You know, a normal human being that wasn't, that didn't necessarily know the ins and outs of, of every funding opportunity that's out there or any particular funding opportunity. It's just supposed to be a quick guide to kind of get you going in the right direction. Um, and this is an example of one of the pages within this guide. Um, for the Guaranteed Conservation Loan. So it has a brief program description, um, an example project, who is eligible, 
the funding amount, how and when to apply, if that's available. Sometimes these things are, are set in stone or, or set in rubber or whatever we want to say, where they happen regularly every year, relatively regularly. Other times um, they don't, so it just sort of depends on the particular um, grant opportunity. This is another one, um, another opportunity that's listed in this um, this catalog of of, um, of potential um, funding opportunities, um, which and it's not something you would necessarily think of right off the bat of a direct operating loan as um, falling under uh, something that would qualify for energy efficiency. But according to their program description, it will assist with soil and water conservation. And so, um, if we're talking about an irrigation system that needs to be replaced or updated, um, this is a potential. Um, avenue for, for funding, for loan, for um, obtaining a loan. So that is one avenue for um, kind of finding what these diverse uh, funding opportunities are. Um, but, you know, the reality is that nobody understands the particular nuances or challenges for these diverse funding sources like the agency programs themselves. So we can, through our you know, nice little brochure, we can make it a bit easier to read through the basics, but there has to be a relationship with the funder so that, you know, the gentleman from the Skinner Ranch can call the local rural development office and say that um, he would, he's interested in using his E3 audit results to apply for cost share on a variable speed drive or something like that. Um, you know, what program do they recommend he apply for or what are they talking about by question six on page 32? You know, these are very complicated grant programs. Um, and so there has to be um, beyond just uh, this sort of nice looking brochure. There has to be, um, you know, this relationship this, um, that we have with potential funders. And we're building this with our um, extension agents as well. and, and um, and the associated NRCS office, because this is, we believe, to be a really critical component, component of this. Um, and it also, we need to increase the number of our extension agents that are trained in, in aspects of this process and, and connecting them with, with who might have that information. Um, right now, we are in the, uh, just checking the time, OK. Um, right now, we have, as I said, we're in the process of do of kind of um, rolling this out at, at a little bit of a greater level. Um, we have, I believe it's eight, eight new agents in addition to the ones we have before that have signed on to, um, to participate in our next stage um, of E3 in Montana Ag. So as I said, we've changed up the training a little bit. You know, we've realized that um, we need to get a little more information on the irrigation. You know, an actual flow meter would be very helpful. We've realized that the diesel efficiency piece is really critical, and we need to um, we need that to be um, we need our agents to be more comfortable and, and able to speak to those um, diesel efficiency opportunities on farm. So we're creating a training um, to um, to kind of take what we've done before and keep that, but then add these additional aspects as well. Um, and we um, almost have our dates set. Um, for um, for May, May 14th and 15th, I believe. Um, and we're still looking for, you know, if there's any agents on the phone from Montana who would be interested in participating in this, we do have, um, we did put out an initial call and have, I believe it's eight new agents signed up um, to go through this training process and to participate in the audit in conducting these audits, but um, but the door is not closed. So if there's anyone on the phone who um, who is interested in participating and being trained in this, um, we would um, gladly accept your um, accept your participation. Um, Again, and, and of course, each of our agents has to um, commit to identifying an ag producer and actually doing one of these assessments. And so um, their role in this is to um, is to cooperate with a producer, you know, identify these, um, whether it's irrigation efficiency, diesel maintenance, lighting, harvest planting regimes, you know, identify what those opportunities are and, um, and write that up in a report. Um, it doesn't necessarily need and that report needs to be, um, we've been working very closely with NRCS in um, providing them with, um, with the information in the format that, um, that their engineers can work with um, in the irrigation department or their, that their engineers can work with on the, um, on the um, crop planning department. So um, 
we uh, so we expect our um, our agents to be at least qualified to provide NRCS or whoever the funding agent is with what they need to to go forth. Um, if the producers have an interest, the agents will align the recommendations with, pretend, with potential funding opportunities. How do producers benefit this, from this again? Um, it's the identification and calculation of energy savings opportunities. So we don't want to just say, you know, you're losing some energy with your particular um, uh, irrigation practice. We want to be able to calculate that. Um, and number two, the assessment results are suitable for submission to multiple federal and state funding programs. Um, with that, I think that was all I had to say. Um, I just again wanted to thank you for your time. Take any questions. Um, let you know that you're, if you are an agent and you want to be part of E3, let me know. Um, if you're a producer, let me know and you're interested in being a part of E3. Um, but if you're a federal agency partner in another state too, um, we are looking at this as being a model that we can use um, in other states. Um, around the country and so we're working closely with EPA to see if we can um, use this model of working with our um, trusted extension agents to um, as as a um, sort of a vessel or, or as a um, to uh, be trained in energy efficiency um, and be able to conduct these audits and I think that that is a win for both the extension agents for extension itself and um, for the producers themselves and being able to identify energy efficiency opportunities. Um, I think that's all I have, Tori. Um, do you know, is there any questions? There sure are, and I apologize. Um, there seemed to have been a little technical glitch when we started, and so if you missed um, and are new to GoToWebinar, if you want to ask a question, you can do that by clicking on the hand and on your control panel, and then I can unmute you and you can ask, or you can just type in the question space, and then I can read it for everyone and for Myla to answer. So um, we do have a couple up on the screen, at least a couple people figured it out. The first question is, is, is USDA a new partner nationally or within Region 8 or Montana only? Sure, that's a good question. USDA is the newest partner nationally. So E3, when we talk about that, it is a national memorandum of understanding between all of those different agencies. So their top people have all gotten together and signed important documents that say, yes, you know, USDA and Department of Energy and SBA will participate in E3. And that happens at a, at, you know, a high federal level. And um, so the what happens is, well, the reality of that is that, uh, well, and then each partner says, and we will contribute by you know, as SBA, we will contribute to E3 by um, providing um, some technical or some, you know, particular grant opportunity to, to those that have gone through that process. Or EPA could say, we, part we agree to participate by providing our technical expertise in lean manufacturing production practices. So, um, so that all happens at, you know, and the federal triangle in DC and the state and the region um, offices and our you know local offices don't necessarily have any idea what E3 is or you know how to participate um, and so um, so there's there's definitely been that kind of um, you know I don't know education curve or I don't know what to call it but um, where you know sure these um, certain group of people sitting in this meeting in, in Washington, D.C. know all about E3 and can converse about it and say they'll participate, but, um, but the local NRCS office might not um, have any idea what that is, and, and they're not sure if they, you know, are required to participate or how they can participate, and, and so there's definitely, you know, some outreach that has gone on to um, to just try and get the word out a little bit about um, about what that means, and it, again, it's not really the what I like about E3 is that it's not creating any new programs. It's just trying to better connect programs that fit together, funding programs or technical programs, and that's what I really like most about it is that it's just trying to use what we have and kind of build off those things or um, leverage them a little more. Okay. Um, 
Another question, uh, do you calibrate estimated CEET diesel use to producer reported purchases? That would be a question for Dan Lucas <laughs> or whoever was actually using the calculator or our technical service provider that we have on contract. Um, I don't know. I assume if that's part of the calculators and part of the, um, um, you know, what some of the what some of the final um, um, report outs or metrics are that that um, that that come out of those particular calculators, and that's what we do. But I don't know offhand if that's what if we how that works. Okay, and um, an early graph showed 80 plus assessments in Texas. What assessments were these? So those were probably, and if we looked at um, at the e3.gov website, they might provide some of some more information about what those those specific um, assessments were, but. Within the realm of agriculture, um, what we're doing in Montana with ag producers is really the only thing that's um, is really the only um, uh, program that has taken E3 and tried to apply it to an ag um, setting, with the exception of um, some food some E3 um, food production. Um, facility assessments, which are ongoing in New York, and they might be going on in Texas as well. But um, some of that, in, I know in New York, they're um, trying to improve the efficiency within um, the dairy production for Greek yogurt. <laughs> because it's taken off so much that um, there's uh, they're having trouble keeping up and, and meeting demand, and uh, much of our. The, um, uh, dairy stock for Greek yogurt comes from New York, I believe. I don't know if I said New York or Vermont before, but it's New York. Um, in Texas, I think most of the facility assessments have been done on manufacturing facilities, and um, and those would be assessments that identified lean production practices for the most part. And these should be listed on the E3 site. Okay, are local utilities, particularly the rural electric co co-ops uh, receptive to this program? They are. You know, it's not trying to replace that or anything. It's, again, like I said, it's um, we we ask that our agents w work with the local or at least inform or get them kind of in the loop with their whatever their r local rural cooperative is. Um, in the case of the Skinner Ranch, you know, they had a great um, uh, starting point with um, a Northwest Energy Audit, they decided not to pursue the particular um, funding. I believe that um, that could have come out of that particular report, um, but the data that was used that you know went into calculating some of those baseline um, energy usage calcs was very important, and, and we really used that. So um, yes. And a follow up to that: Are renewable energy options considered? So renewable energy options are considered under the the REAP program, um, uh, which is a rural, rural energy America program, is that right? Um, under rural development, um, cause there are um, loan opportunities for or grant opportunities um, for renewable energy practices, and so um, those are another. It's a great question because that's another avenue that's not covered that is, is very important for energy efficiency, but not covered necessarily under the NRCS calculators. And so that's, again, another avenue that we have to, um, we have to just kind of work creatively, I think, with our, um, with our agents when they, um, when, when they have a producer that's interested in um, converting to some aspect of renewable energy, um, we need to, we've just been kind of um, crossing that um, bridge as we go. All right, any more questions? Okay, one more. At the end, well, not one more. If anybody else has any, feel free to ask. At the end, please announce the technical sh Oh. Sorry, Milt. This is just uh, instructions to me to announce the technical short, the, uh, the next webinar coming up on April 8th from 1 to 1.30 Mountain Time, and that'll be on um, USDA programs.
Any other questions for, oh, can we get a copy of your PowerPoint, Myla? Yes, I will give that to you, and you can post that if you like. Yep, I think we'll get that up on the you. we'll get okay. that up on the ETA yeah. website. So <clears throat> perfect. Uh, all right. My um, contact information is Myla, M Y L A dot Kelly K E L L Y at Montana dot edu, and I think that's also listed on the um, on the web page that you see. Who, address you see right there. So, but it's myla.kelly at montana.edu if you've got any follow-up. Okay, thanks very much everyone and um, hopefully we'll have some of you back on board on April 8th and thanks for participating. <laughs>